this so Did we manage to mess up something or? It's making noise. All right, making noise is good. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I see some light now. Uh, yeah, okay. So it has a sleep mode. I think actually want to give you a bit of pointers on the on the literature. Now, so there is, a, I, so there is a book, the first edition of Model Predictive Control, by uh, David Main and Jim Rawlings. That book, in general, I find to be an excellent source of references. Uh, I'm not sure you you might be able to get the second edition through library, but I do suggest looking at this book. And uh, the book, of course, is written over a period of time, so many concepts and ideas I was explaining are explained in at much slower pace, so even with simpler examples and so on and so forth. So you might, look t you might like to look at that book. I ha also extracted chapters from the set Theoretic Methods in Control, which is a book by Franco Blanchini and uh, Stefano Miani. That book is good. You have a chapter on Lyapunov and Lyapunov-like functions. It's a worth reading. Uh, you also have a chapter on invariant sets. You'll see that in this book, actually, there are uh, problems co which are considered in both continuous and discrete time, and we were covering discrete time, so you just go through discrete time. You'll see a lot of additional discussion and uh, also a lot of uh, additional algebraic conditions and constructions in this book. I was trying to keep it at the level which is, uh, at the times, not exploiting structure. You also have this, what is called dynamic programming. You can find that in the book by Main and Rawlings. But here, the interesting thing for you is to look this infinite time reachability set and the uh, related constructions and also the set theoretic analysis of dynamical systems. So those, are th those two books are, uh, or parts of the books are worth exploring. Uh, in terms of the articles, I have extracted all articles that cover tubes uh, some of the forward reachability and uh, essentially also the, well, I mean, robust MPC in more general sense. You have this min-max feedback MPC, which is a short paper worth reading. This paper, even though it uses trees for predictions, it's useful to look at. It was a kind of first paper that has brought up and clarified the difference between open loop and closed loop in MPC. Uh, funnily enough, for a period of time, people consider, because MPC repeats this, uh, this optimization, that it was a feedback. So MPC, it is a feedback, but it's a feedback based on the repetition of open loop. So open loop as an optimal control for uncertainty is not suitable. So therefore, if your basic block is bad, the fact that you're repeating it doesn't mean you're going to get something good. So this paper points out that actually if you want to handle uncertainty, your basic block in a way, well, not in these words, but it points out the difference between closed loop and open loop. As I said, surprisingly enough, that was not well understood in the, in the field for a number of uh, years. And even now, I think uh, it's, it's a concept that needs to be grasped properly. Uh, I have also generated support. Now, support has a convexity background from the Bankini's book. And there are two papers by Gilbert and his students, who are now professors, Stan and uh, Kolmanowski. This will also provide some additional details on construction of maximal positively and robust positive invariant sets. There is a paper I wrote with uh, Rafael Gobel, which gives you the overview of the, well, essentially, well-posedness, uh, 
invariance, stability, and the consistent improvement in MPC. The paper is very rigorous. It gives you all definitions of involved maths, set value analysis, and it provides also some background and parametric optimization, which is needed. And you have these invariant approximations of maximal, and uh, that's the one I added lately. Um, now, the other thing, there, is, there are theses. Is, so there is a thesis by John Lofberg, Johan, Lo Johan Lofberg, sorry, not John. Johan Lofberg is the guy who, who has written up YALMIP, which is modeling toolbox. It's an interesting toolbox to look at. And uh, he has a chapter on min-max uh, model prediction control. So there was one more lecture, which unfortunately I didn't cover. And that's the one when you use this, what is called affine in the past disturbances feedback. And that's elaborated. Well, this has been used in optimization uh, community, but Johan kind of put it in a framework for MPC. So it's a worth looking at that chapter. Uh, Articles, books, supports, surveys. Survey papers are quite influential there too. Uh, you'll see that essentially the, this, this first survey, constrained model predictive control, is very likely the most downloaded paper in Automatica. So that tells you how popular MPC, and this is the more recent by David Main. So these are also worth looking to give you a uh, perspective on the field. Um, as I said, the Handbook of Model Predictive Control has just been released. It's a book that I edited with uh, William Levine. William Levine is the editor of the Big Controls Handbook. And these are Springer's books. They have some material which might be useful for you to read because they treat sub-areas in MPC in detail by various authors. And I think the Handbook of MPC is worth reading. So once you get access to the book on in the library, just look at it. Uh, so that would be all on the literature. I think that's very much what I wanted to, to, to say. In terms of the slides, I do need to share some slides with you. Now, as I said, lecture four is <laughs> empty. This is where pseudo code was supposed to go. So I'll fill it up once the pseudo code is there. The same with the lecture eight. Uh, now, Today we did cover lecture 14 and lecture 15. And I believe lecture, mm, what did we do? We, we, did, we didn't do optimize time. This is the one we missed. So we did 14, 15, and 9, I believe. Yeah. So these three I need to share with you. I'll send you links right now. I'll also send you a link for lecture 13. So you have a slides just for your information. Uh, and then. What I'll do after that, I'll actually like to go through all of you so you can give me what you learned, what you didn't learn, how this might be useful for your studies, etc. Just to give me feedback on what we've done. Come on. Okay. So we can start from the corner. So let's 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 do the following thing. Tell me what you learned about controllability under constraints and reachability under constraints. That was lecture one. Well, um, was that the part where we did the maximum control in That's that was the final kind of step, but we did something before that. So what was the first thing? In order to solve n-step problem, we first looked at the one-step problem. To solve one-step problem, we characterized pre-image set, one-step controllable set, and the control set. And we provided details for polyhedral, a fine polyhedral setting. And then we looked at the reachability questions. And of course, as a limit, we looked at these maximal sets. Now, we also had this technique, and the code is given, which does minimum time control to the origin. So one of the things that actually I think should have come across is what? That actually even though constraints might be simpler, controllable sets might be, do they remain simple as state and control constraints? Or no. they might be getting presumably more complicated. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's what I expected. <laughs> 
So what did you learn in that in that in that context? No escaping. <laughs> So essentially, first, is the, is the control under constraints possible for all states in the constraint set? No. No. It's only possible within certain controllable sets. Yeah. And these controllable sets were functions of what? They were functions of... What, when you call your function, what did you have to pass to your functions? System? Call the system. Original constraints and target set. So controllable sets were essentially functions of these three things. Can you clarify what target set was in that context? Was target set just was a set where you wanted the system to end up. Yeah. And target set was a terminal set that we used in MPC. Yeah. All right, so the, what about reachability, the girl next to you? I'm really sorry, I didn't ask for a name, so I'll have to just describe. What about reachability? Mm -hmm. He can answer to your question. I beg your pardon? He's much better than me to answer your question. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, w w what, I mean, w w what do you research in? Mm -hmm. What do you research in? Uh, operation and control of heat power cycles. Operation and control at? Okay. So are any of these techniques for constraint control useful for your research or not? Probably not. Well, I can't hear you. Maybe others can. Not at this point. Not all I can see now. Maybe in the future, but I'm not so sure. Okay. Well, I'll remember you as a girl with attitude. <laughs> the next guy. <laughs> so, in terms of the... What was additional complication when you had uncertainty in the system? And you looked at the controllability questions. So there was, an, there was additional complexity that you had this intermediate set of getting effective target set, which took care of the uncertainty. So what conclusions in, in the case of the uncertainty if one of the controllability sets was empty, what would be conclusion you can draw based on that? No, in terms of the min-max controllability, when you have controllability and the uncertainty, and when you compute controllable sets backwards in time, if, if it happens to be that at some point in time this set is empty, what's the conclusion you would draw? So if controllable set is empty, it means there is no states you can control. If there are no states you can control, obviously the size of the uncertainty is, is too big for the given control authority. Okay. And you can just use feedback to control? So what kind of controls did we use in the controllability and controllability under uncertainty? Did we use closed loop or open loop? Closed loop. So, so that's precisely the feedback. <laughs> okay. So, what about the backward reachability under uncertainty? So, what was the difference compared to the traditional ones? So, we had, in the traditional one, we were interested just in maximal positive invariant set. What about backward reachability under uncertainty? We were interested in maximal. What about the forward? We were interested in? Uh, I can't remember. So, there were minimal and maximal robust positive invariant sets, yeah? And what was the interplay between the two? So in order for maximal to exist, to be non-empty, what condition minimal would have to satisfy? I didn't get a firm grasp on it. It has to be? I, I didn't get a firm grasp on it. So you, you didn't? I, get a, uh, I didn't understand completely. The question or the lecture? The, the lecture. Okay. So the... So in that context, when you looked at it, in ordinary backward reachability, without uncertainty, existence of an equilibrium point within constraints was enough to guarantee non-emptiness of backward reachable sets, and therefore of the maximal positive invariant set. When we have uncertainty, we cannot stabilize an equilibrium, but rather we stabilize a set. 
And the best, the set that, that he stabilized in the contractive setting was the minimal robust positive invariant set. So therefore, for maximal to be non-empty or for any robust positive invariant set to exist, the minimal robust positive invariant set had to be included in the constraints. So it had to be constraint admissible. So the relation between the two is very much the same as in the other one. So the minimal robust positive invariant set plays a role of an equilibrium under uncertainty. Okay. Now, what was the next thing we were doing? So MPC, how about MPC? Tell me, what is MPC and describe it. How would you describe it? Imagine I don't know anything about MPC and you have to tell me about MPC. You have to convince me MPC is the best thing since sliced bread in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. With constraints. All right. So, what does MPC really do? What does it use? I mean, how would you say? It? I mean, that's kind of quite general what you described. So, if you're given a state of the process, what do you do in MPC? What do you solve in order to get a control for MPC? It, it produces um, optimal control. So, you solve an optimal control problem, yeah. and what do you do then for a control? You only apply first element in this control. And then what do you do at the next point in time? At the next state, what do you do? You repeat the same procedure. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> what were the conditions? Why actually there was a need to introduce this terminal constraint set and terminal cost function? So in, in a way, what did we say? We said if you had infinite horizon problem, this problem might lead to stabilizing feedback. But as we are typically doing finite horizon, what is the role of the terminal constraint set? So what do we need? If you, you know, if you take infinite horizon and then you cut it to the finite horizon, there is something you're throwing away. And if you just throw it away, things may not work. So with the terminal ingredients, you want to make sure things do work. So terminal set would account for constraints which were neglected. <laughs> okay, so terminal set is typically introduced to account for truncation of constraints that you actually ignore compared to the infinite horizon. And for that reason, you use invariance concepts. Very much the same. What about the cost function, terminal cost function? What it was used for? So if you neglected part of the trajectory, we, we have neglected the effect of the cons constraints in the future that we ignore. But then we also have cost in the future, which we cannot ignore. So terminal cost function upper bounds the cost of the infinite horizon and induces stabilizing Lyapunov properties. So that's why essentially it's typically Lyapunov function in the terminal set. Are you about terminal Your turn will come. Will come. <laughs> <laughs> right. Of course, of course you can. Terminal constraint set? Or yeah, term, terminal constraint set or terminal set. I mean. Is that just the XF, that's XF we use. That's like future space So essentially what happens when you look at the infinite horizon problem, there is no terminal constraint set. You're just solving problem in which the trajectory is subject to constraints. Now you have done finite horizon, which means you have neglected things from that point in your predictions to the infinity. So there was a bunch of constraints which existed, Correct. infinitely many for the future states which you are throwing away. So in order to account for that, you are adding these positive invariance conditions on terminal sets. So you don't end up everywhere, but you end up somewhere where you can continue the process at the next point in time. So the same for the cost. Now the, <laughs> all right, so I, I'm going to ask the girl next to you, the one that actually always had questions <laughs> and requests for everybody to wait. <laughs> No, in a positive sense. So what about, what about, um, so what kind of control is MPC? How would you describe it? Is it a closed loop or open loop? Uh, combination. It is a combination. So effectively it is a feedback, but why it's a feedback? Well, because you're basing it on the current. Because, because on current. The rest. but the predictions are open loop. So it's a repetition of open loop control, which makes it a feedback. So it's not fully general feedback.
good. Now, the, when you have uncertainty, what kind of predictions you need to employ? What happens when you have uncertainty system? Can you do just predictions of isolated trajectories so you have to look at something more complex? Yeah, it, it's you, have <laughs> at, you, know, you have to look at sets, so okay. you, have to, you can't look at the point or hit the point anymore, but you can, you can make sure that you hit the So essentially, what are you controlling? Are you controlling trajectories of points or you're controlling? Yeah, you're controlling trajectories of sets. And then you ensure that trajectories are included inside yeah. of the sets, okay. Right, so what kind of parameterizations did we look at? For linear systems, okay. Good. So, what kind of underlying principles these parameterizations did use? Sorry? Uh, what kind of underlying principle this, did this parameterization use? So, what we were e effectively doing? Okay. That's homothetic. The okay. Well, that's very good. So essentially, you were separating dynamics on the nominal dynamics without uncertainty, and the ones which were with the error, which were capturing with these various shapes. And every method used different shapes. All right. So in terms of com computational complexity, which method seemed the simplest to you? But which, if, if you had a design problem, which method would you use? Uh, yeah. It depends on the s system, the state. So like, if the rigid one works well, and if you have limited computation power, then... So, so essentially the good idea would be to have a, this set of methods as a toolbox, you explore and see which one. Now, in terms of... Uh, well, I'm running out of the questions. <laughs> in terms of... Uh, in terms of the computation of minimal robust positively invariant set, so what was the difficulty with computing exact minimal robust positively invariant set, and what you were computing instead? Uh, for the exact one, you have to sum infinite number of sets, right? So you make an approximation. And what kind of approximations we looked at? There were two. Outer and inner. Okay, and why did we look at these two approximations? Because you can sum them with finite number of. Okay, that's one of the things, but why did you look at both approximations? By looking at the distance between those two approximations, what could we say? Well, the distance between them, uh, depending on alpha, says something about how close you are to the exact one. Good. Okay, good. Right. So now I'm going to ask you... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. Can it's your turn. Uh, uh, I think this theory is too difficult. But if I want to parse this this course, I need to use those uh, theories on my research. You need to use the, the, the theories you 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 you, uh, you teach us okay. on my research. I, I think my research will need uh, so high quality theories. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Well, question could have been what kind of what kind of methods could you use for your research? And finally, I'll ask you a question. What did you learn from the course? <laughs> did, you, did you distinguish finally between the maximal and the minimal? No. You still <laughs> didn't distinguish. Why? Let's clear up. Typically, when you iterate backward reachability and the proper assumptions on dynamics and the constraints, typically this means continuity of the dynamics and compactness of the constraints, when the iteration converges, it gives us maximal set with the desired property. Backward reachability is used to determine the sets of safe states. In other words, states of how long you... If you do n-step backward reachability, this gives you sets of all initial conditions which over n steps don't violate constraints. Or no, in the nominal case, while in the robust case, no matter what disturbance happens, they don't go outside of the constraints. In the limit, this gives you the maximal robust positive invariant set. Forward dynamics, in the contractive case, we're giving you the minimal robust positive invariant set. The minimal robust positive invariant... So the minimal robust positive invariant set was the robust positive invariant set which is contained in all other robust positive invariant sets. So it's minimal with respect to the set inclusion. So it is a robust positive invariant set which is contained in any other robust positive invariant set in plain words. I 
I still didn't get uh, the point of the like your forward. Uh, okay, so. Can you also draw something so that's, uh, I can't. Well, I mean, you remember these tube cross sections? Yes. So where did we converge to? After all, yes. we converged to this dark set. That set was minimal robust positive invariant set. So the minimal robust positive invariant set plays a role of an equilibrium set when you have uncertainty in the system. So when you have uncertainty in the system, you cannot converge to a point, but rather you converge to a set. And you want to converge to minimal such set. So, so we, we just want to set as, uh, as small as possible? Well, the, the size of the sets will be determined by the closed loop dynamics and the size of the disturbance and geometry of the disturbance. But, but uh, anyhow, we, we just want to keep it... Uh, <laughs> Ideally, I, that's why we want the minimal. We want the smallest possible neighborhood of an equilibrium to which we converge. Okay. All right. Okay, so I'm running out of the questions. Now you, you can have a round... You can do one cycle until I send you lectures and you can tell me what you like and what you didn't like about the course. Feel free to be frank. And maybe we can uh, close after that. Yeah, go on. Now that we had this round where you made sure people understood, I think it might have been good to have them more frequently, like after lectures or each day. Sum up kind of and session. And have more interaction to check if we're all on the same page. But to me, it felt like pacing it hard and okay. Does anybody have a question? And often, then it's not silent because it's all clear. It's the very opposite of that. It's silent because people have not come far enough actually to ask the question. At least it was from my perspective. Well, oh, that's fine. Um, so, do you think that actually it would help if the course was spread over two weeks instead of one week? Yeah, we spread out the content over more time or shrink it down to have more time for specific topic. Okay. I, I think that would be what I would prefer for okay. people in it. Were there any benefits? <laughs> well, well, a better understanding, obviously. Okay. Now, the, the girl with the attitude. <laughs> All right. I'll look forward to that email. The, what are the pros and cons of the lectures? I'm listening. Just go, go around. I'm listening. I just want to send you lectures. Did you prepare a lecture, lecture note? Not just a slide, just a lecture note. Okay. So they can read before the course. Okay. Okay. All right. Any drawbacks? Anything you didn't like? Uh, notation or. Okay. Okay. Completion. Simplifying notation, okay. Uh, for me, it was a lot of mess, and uh, it's been a long time since I've done it myself. So for me, it was a little fast. Okay. So effectively, I think so far I'm getting the pattern that actually this would have been much better done over two weeks rather than over one week. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's good to have all kinds of information in Google Drive. To have more? All kinds of information in Google Drive. Okay. Good. What kind of information? Uh, like it was good. Books and PDFs, lecture slides and books. Having it, all the information. Was that was good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. What was bad? <laughs> uh, there are a lot, a lot of things to study at hand. Okay. So essentially, I, I think now it's for sure that the course should be spread over two weeks rather than over a week. That's for sure. Okay. So just continue until I... Okay. <laughs> I'm listening, just continue. Yeah, I think the lectures in general in general were good. But a bit too fast, that's okay. uh, said. Um, but I think the programming sessions were much too fast. And I don't think it helps that you are telling us how incredibly easy it is. Okay. <laughs> how fast we should do it, because that just... Yes. Is it even more frustrating to not be able to do it? Okay. Or you can prepare exercise, maybe. 
we have a lab jump uh, exercise mode. We have prepared the exercise as one, two, three, and a piece of paper. Okay, so essentially what you're saying, if you had the hands, hands out before the lectures, it would have helped. Like we have a paper, this is exercise one, this is two, and Okay. But there was a, did you get distributed course description? There was a list of the topics. So I think actually that needs to be improved in a sense that I link it to the material that you may want to study to the lecture. Okay. That's also good. Just, I mean, feel free to be honest, because essentially I'm, I'm asking you this so I, at the next point in time when I iterate on the course, I improve it. I take into account what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, well, the biggest issue was the programming. It goes too fast. But now, can you tell me one thing? Was the numerical part of the exercise good for you or bad for you? It was good. I definitely but was it, was, it, was it too much or...? Uh, no, it was just that it takes a bit of time to digest things. Okay. So actually, so maybe get, yeah, as it was suggested, write down the exercises, what you want us to do, send it on a PDF or something. Okay. Then we can so actually, what I think. It's very nice to have the slides available when you're doing the exercises if you can't remember all the constraints. And well, I was bringing up the slides, but yeah, I think actually, I, I, yeah, yeah that, that's true. So I think actually one of the things that actually it, it, it definitely seems it, it's a timing. I think essentially amount of information for amount of time which was given was a bit overwhelming. The lectures were a lot better when you were kind of on route because when you were behind you could talk really fast. Well, I started slowly, but then the time, the I was, a pro I was a, you know, when you start approaching constraint, you have to speed up your controls. <laughs> it's MPC. No, that's. Uh, I have I to. I, I have to learn. I have to. I. I have to learn how to do that. I learned from you this uh, window plus. <laughs> I didn't know that shortcut before. All right. Uh, yeah, I, I like that we had the programming exercises. I felt that that what we'd gone through in the lectures sort of came together when we we did the programming. Um, but uh, what would be nice is, I guess, what you were thinking of doing for the next time you were teaching the course was to have, like, we could do the programming ourselves, but then actually give the code so later on. So we're all on the same page. Okay, I, I'll tell you one thing now. This is this is uh, this this was this numerical side was a bit of experiment by myself as well. Uh, last year we this did in a Wisconsin American MPC summer school, and we had a session on the lectures. It was actually done even much better in a way because students were. Uh, split into groups and they had a mini project to do. So they had to learn the techniques and apply it to a problem. But that was slightly different because it was a whole day just that. So you didn't do anything else. So you separated a week for doing just that. S for students, that's what I meant. Now, I understand you have other obligations, other courses and so on and so forth. So I think actually what I realized is that what I didn't know, I didn't know how much of numerics I should add. So I was trying to follow up on the lectures to illustrate all concepts. And what you actually now said, I realized also was, is the way to do things. is really to let students play with the code, and then once the lectures are completed, provide the code so they can compare. Yeah, then, then you can compare with what you did, yeah. and then you're also, for the next day, you're on the same page, so you, yeah. you have some code to work So on. I think th this, this, is a fair, this is a very fair and constructive criticism, so it's a very good point. Thank you. I'm listening. <laughs> Because uh, I'm not a very mathematical person, but I'm most likely going to use it in practice, and that's why it's good to have like coded it down. Okay. So you don't have to do the proving of the stability and everything else later. So that's good. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, so since everyone is saying said all the pros and cons, I guess I what I failed that I learned from the course, and that's taking off things, taking off noise as a set, and taking off like controls as a set, which I have. Have you haven't done before? That was yeah. Really cool. Yeah. And also like splitting up the dynamic, make it have like one S which controls like uh, ensures stability inside the set, and the other 
nominal block, which that was really cool. That was something okay. new, new perspective. Good. Yeah. Good. I think I sent I sent you a link with the lecture slides. Okay. So you'll get the links with the lectures four and eight when the pseudo code is completed and they are filled. Anyways, I, I was planning to have section four and section lectures four and eight just discussing the code and things. So I did plan to have discussions intermediately, but okay, I mean it sometimes it doesn't quite go according to what you plan. All right, so the next person. Can I just add one, one Sure. Yeah. I really like to have the slides before the lecture, so I can take notes on them. Yeah. Well, okay, I'll, I'll take that now into account. What, what, what my concern was, if I gave you slides before the lectures, that actually you would be focusing on looking at the slides instead of listening to me. And I thought the slides, but maybe, as you say, maybe you want to make comments, so maybe it's better to distribute slides before. Because if you're discussing an equation, I can just write the notes next to the okay. equation. OK, so I think actually I'll keep that in mind as well for the future. Adding on that, I'm not getting distracted looking at the slides during the lecture, but looking at the slides before the lecture will also help. OK. Just looking through them, seeing what's coming. OK. Yeah, I would agree with that, that if we got the slides beforehand, I think then we could have looked through them once. And then when you showed the slides to us and we're talking about So it's, it's a bit of less of surprise. Yeah, well, then, then we're focusing on the on you talking, not the slide. And okay. Then the slide. So, so having the slides beforehand, I guess you have okay. some sort of prior idea of what's going on, and then maybe you can actually get more focus on what you're saying. Okay. Right. So that's yeah. definitely that's definitely to be taken into account. Uh -huh. What did you think of the course? Too fast for me. Too fast. Yes. Okay, so that's on a bad side. Anything on the good side? Uh, but I think it's my fault since I didn't have adding control background. This is the first class for me. Okay. Control. Okay. Okay. What about you? Your judgment on the course? I would say, like, uh, for example, when you're just trying to cover some like uh, mathematical definition, I would say if you can add some like. Uh, Targeable example, like if you draw something on the blackboard, which is easier for us to understand. And uh, sometimes when it comes to the end of the course, uh, I think you are not trying to let us understand something. You just want to finish the slide, and you just uh, okay. read through everything so fast. And uh, at least for me, I just can't catch catch up with. And yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Any any, any final comments? And more um, conceptual explanation of things, and also like the sets. When you define like set S R, it gives like a definition. But uh, in your brain, you have like seen this before, so you know what to, what which parts to take out and how to decode it. I'm like, whoa! Now, like, really quickly, like, what's now one thing which actually I'll tell you, I've been kind of quite uh, gentle to you in terms of coding because my initial plan was to let you code everything. Get your code, put it together, hoping you'll get perfect code, much better code than me. No, not the code, the like uh, set definitions on the slides. Okay. So if you if you just like when you create now, a set and have definition, you I explain conceptually what this set is. You're in a way in a good position. I gave this course several times, and I did it typically on a blackboard without any slides. So the other guys had to copy everything. So, <laughs> so no, I mean it's an effort to prepare. So this is the first. Um, I'm not trying to be funny. It's just the it's the first um, time I'm, I prepare the slides, and actually I un underestimated how much time you need to prepare 15 times 20, 300 slides. Even though you generate a template, it actually it is a bit of uh, especially if you're on, on a seaside wanting to get some holiday. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think actually if I do come in the future, the other guys will benefit more. Because now once this is a base, so it's much easier to refine. And that's why I ask you for the feedback to get the things how to split better. I also realized that as I was doing lectures that actually maybe the ideal thing would be actually to have maybe two hours of lectures, one hour of numerics over two weeks. And then actually follow up this precisely once you finish numerics, I give you a code so you can compare your code. And I'll take, uh, I'll take on board this suggestion for actually distributing slides prior to lectures, I think. And as I said, slides, 
are not perfect, but I think they're pretty good to refresh your memory when you read the papers and everything. So uh, it was also good, I mean, as you mentioned, that the structure was repetitive. But that's what I done intentionally, because by repeating it at one point, it just becomes your own. It, you just get used to it. So that's why I've done intentionally, so actually. Good, but I mean, as Stella as says, it's like a bit, you introduce a lot of different variables and stuff. And uh, four or five slides later, uh, it, we, we have to know what each of those yes. is. So I, I think you would solve it all together with distributing the slides a priori so people okay. can have it just, just as a note. Okay. No, well, I mean, I think I'll keep that in mind. I'll thank you for attending the lecture course. I thank you also for the feedback. I appreciate it. And I wish you best of luck in the exam. Just monitor things in October, beginning of October, I think by then hopefully I'll distribute the pseudo code for the rest of the course. And uh, if I do if I do put some of this code on the slides, you'll have them on the slides. Okay, so a big part? I, I did mention earlier that I actually not only toolbox, I think I developed QMPC in general. So the the I do have a toolbox, but at this stage it's not for a public use. I haven't completed my research, I'm planning to write the monograph. And uh, well, I want to have advantage <laughs> after I invested a number of years doing research. So hopefully if I manage my plans, I think within a year or two years that there will be a book and toolbox just treating these problems. But if I manage, I don't, I don't know. There are many plans you have and then you have to replan things in life. Now I have, I have one, one, one simple question. I want to go and have a drink in this evening, so where do I go to try? Where is a good place to go out? <laughs> Actually, I, I think I, I'm not dressed for some kind of fancy places, so beer would do quite well. Yeah, because you have the Benguon album, uh, yeah. or Miko Drigiria, yeah. 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 Uh, which is quite good. And Where is that place? Yeah. Where's your... Uh, I'm, sca I'm staying in Scanding Bucklet. <laughs> well, this doesn't have to go on, <laughs> this doesn't have to go on record. <laughs> <laughs>